So this video is going to look at reconstructive memory or schema theory as a theory of memory and it also includes Bartlett's War of the Ghost study which is your key study for GCSE psychology within Edexcel as well. So you need to know that all the way through. Reconstructive memory then is the theory that memories are not exactly what was encoded. So this idea that memory doesn't work like a video camera, you don't just press record and then remember everything exactly as it happens. But actually what happens is, is you encode that memory and you store it within your mind. But actually what happens is your pre-existing experiences and um, understanding of the world can actually influence what you remember within that memory. And it's these pre-existing knowledges, um, pre-existed knowledge, sorry, or experiences that are called schema. And it's this idea then that schema can influence or change your memory. So Bartlett is saying that our memory isn't actually that reliable. We can't rely on it to be able to give us direct and, and clear information as to exactly what happened in an event, because what happens is our mind will reconstruct them. It will change them based on what we expect to happen um, or based on what we know about certain situations. Now, in order to reconstruct the past, we do this because we try and make our memory fit in with our existing schema. So, for example, our schema is our pre-existing understanding or knowledge of the world or our experiences. So, for example, if you showed me a bird, I might remember that that bird had two wings because my understanding and my knowledge of a bird is that a bird has two wings, even though actually that bird that you showed me had a broken wing or um, had, you know, different colour feathers than I might expect or whatever. I might change that memory to reflect what I already know about this world and what I already understand about it. Now, as a result of that, because my schema is changing my memory, my memory is therefore unreliable. So actually what I'm recalling isn't necessarily exactly what happened in the first place. So again, as I've said, our schema is our pre-existing knowledge or experiences of the world that we store within our mind and how this can affect our memory. I always explain schema as well like building blocks, because if you think about it as you're learning as a child or think about it like Lego blocks, if you're building something out of Lego, say you're building a tower out of Lego, in order to be able to put the top bit on the tower and put the roof on the tower, you've got to have the foundations first. And that's a bit like how we learn information. So, for example, for you to understand that a penguin is a bird that doesn't fly, for example, that's quite a complex piece of information that you might learn later in life. In order to be able to understand that, you first have to have a building block, a Lego block of what a bird is. So the fact that a bird is something that flies and that might be the first Lego block that you put down on your tower because it's the first piece of information that you understand. You might then, for example, have another piece of Lego that says birds are brown because the first bird that you saw was a robin and it was brown. But then as you go through life and you go to your grandma's house and she's got a green canary and says, oh, you know, that's a bird. You then might put another Lego block on top of what you already knew, where you then start saying, OK, well, I actually know that birds can also include canaries, which can also be green. And then you might be watching the Discovery Channel one day and you learn that not all birds fly. And then you put another Lego block. And, and eventually, as you put all this information together, you start with your building blocks, building a real picture and an understanding of the world around you. Now, this also means that you will therefore have schemas and things that you expect for certain situations. So, for example, if I said to you, draw me a picture of what a criminal looks like, you would be able to do it. You would draw me a picture of a criminal, but that picture would represent either your previous experiences or your knowledge or something that you've seen on TV. Your picture would reflect your schema, your pre-existing experience and understanding of what a criminal is. But what can the problem be? Say, for example, for a criminal, you drew a teenage boy wearing a hoodie and a balaclava and riding a bike. And then you witnessed a robbery in a shop, for example, and the police are questioning you and they're saying, what did that robber wear? You might then say, oh, he was wearing a hoodie and he wasn't wearing a hoodie, in fact. But your schema, your understanding and pre-existing experience of the fact that criminals wear hoodies, for example, has infiltrated or influenced your memory. So actually, when you've recalled it, you've recalled it wrong because your schema has confabulated or changed your memory. Now, memory does use schemas in order to be able to organise things. So if we recall in our event, our schema will be able to tell us what might have happened or what's supposed to happen. But as I said to you, your schemas might fill in a gap in your memory, which is called confabulating, where they're actually changing what it is that you remember based on what they experienced. 
Now, the bottom two parts here are a little bit more advanced, but it's still good for you to know this. So we might assimilate information. So we change our schema to fit what we've learned. So, for example, you might um, change the building block that says all birds are brown and you might change that and say, actually, they're not all brown. And that's where we assimilate. We change our schema. Now, a lot of the time this happens when something that we've witnessed or something that we remember was really obviously not what we would expect. So, for example, if you um, saw a pink bird, a bright pink bird, the first time that you saw that, rather than just recall that bird as green because that's what you expected, you would recall it as pink and you would go into your mind and you would change your schema and say, actually, that's wrong. Not all birds are green or brown because I've just seen a pink one because it kind of stood out. So it made you remember it. The opposite of this, though, is where you accommodate. And this is what happens a little bit more regularly. And this is where you change your memory to keep your schema intact. So, for example, you wouldn't remember that that bird was pink. You would say, no, 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 birds are always green or brown. Um, and therefore, you would recall that bird is green or brown because that's what your schema says. There's just an example of a quick exam question, something that you might be asked on this, but you can see here, um, AJ is in a psychology class and a female intruder enters. She threatens the teacher and takes the mobile phone. The next day, AJ says that the intruder was male and carrying a knife, which we know isn't true, and explain why uh, AJ's memory for the event might be inaccurate. It's obviously talking about schema and reconstructive memory here because it's this idea of not being able to recall information correctly. But you can see two marks here quite nicely allocated. Reconstructive memory theory suggests people actively reconstruct events using their schema. That's your first mark. Your second mark then is your AO2 because you know it's a scenario. So you know you've got to go back and explain it to the scenario. So AJ's schema of an intruder might, be, might reflect the fact that his pre-existing experience of an intruder might be male and carrying a weapon. And that's why he's changed his memory. OK, so Bartlett's War of the Ghost. So as I mentioned, I appreciate this is a long video, but this is because this is your key study for this. So you have to know this study inside out. You have to know the aim, the method, the results and the conclusion in lots and lots of detail. Now, Bartlett's study or Bartlett's aim was to investigate whether the memory of a story can be affected by previous knowledge and to find out if that cultural background and the unfamiliarity of a different culture story would lead to that distortion of memory while it was recalled. He also wanted to test this idea then if whether memory is reconstructive and whether people do store and retrieve information um, for expectations which are formed by cultural schemas. Now, to do this, he actually took 20 British participants. There were seven women and 13 men, and the participants were not told the aim of the study. So think ethics. Uh, they believed that they were being tested on accuracy of recourse. There's a bit of deception there that they didn't know what was going on. Bartlett then used what we call a repeated reproduction, which is basically where participants hear a story or they see a drawing and they're asked to reproduce it after a short time and then do it again over a certain amount of days and then again after a certain amount of weeks, months, years, etc. Now, the story he used was a Native American story called The War of the Ghosts, which is particularly unfamiliar to the participants. And he purposely chose it because it contains unknown names and concepts and um, to make sure that the story content was totally unfamiliar for the participants. Now, the story was selected because it would test how memory may be reconstructed based on cultural schemas. So what happened was each participant read themselves the story twice and the first reproduction was 15 minutes later. So there was no set interval beyond this. And actually, the participants recalled the story at further intervals from, you know, some did it 20 hours later, some did it 10 years later. Now, Bartlett found that these participants changed the story as they tried to remember it. And this happened even from the early stages, so right from 15 minutes and then throughout the further reproductions. Now, overall, participants kind of preserved the order of the events and the, the kind of main themes. So they got the gist of what was going on in the story. But the reproduction of the style was often changed. And the reproduction of the story was also kind of starting to be transformed as they tried to change what things were going on. Now, seven of these 20 participants omitted the title, so they totally forgot the title. And 10 of the participants actually changed the title from War of the Ghosts to A War Ghost Story. Now, other transformations or changes included things like changing words such as canoes to boats, or they might have changed the name of the characters to represent their own culture and their own experiences. Now, much of this content was rationalised by the participants who changed material to make it more acceptance to them. Now, Bartlett called this effort after meaning. So basically, for example, participants were changing the story so that it made sense to them to help them to remember it. So such as the young man did not feel sick, but nevertheless, they carried on going home. 
Now, in order to conclude what Bartlett found here, he actually said then that the accuracy in the reproduction of the story is an exception rather than a norm of memory. So he's actually saying that memory isn't very accurate. He says that style, rhythm, and the precise way that a story is constructed is often really rarely reproduced. So he's saying that we're never really accurate with our memory. After repeated reconstruction, so the number of times that they've told the story, the form and even the items of the story can become stereotyped. So actually, we can totally change the point of that story to represent what we would expect to happen. And actually, they don't change much after that stereotype has happened because it's easier for us to remember things that fit in with our schema or our beliefs. However, with infrequent reproduction, so omission of detail, simplification um, and transformation, then this can carry on forever. So participants can continue to forget details the longer and longer that they wait before they recall the story again. There's also a significant amount of interference with the story from reconstructing it. So, for example, we're changing things and details of the story to fit in with our own interests and things that we would expect to happen. And in all the recollections of the story, our rationalisation of what we would expect to happen caused us to form um, a story that was more accessible or common to us. So we took out the cultural bits of the story that didn't make sense to us and we made it reflect something that we would understand or expect to happen. So we changed it maybe to fit in with our social group. We might have changed the name or the story, like we said before, about changing that idea of canoes to boats, because that's just more common to us. Now, Bartlett's study, unfortunately, obviously is in the 30s and it's a classic study. And as a result of that, we can have a bit of an evaluation, uh, sorry, a bit of a field day with the evaluation because he didn't use many experimental controls at all. There are stories of him bumping into participants on the streets 10 years later and saying, oh, by the way, while you're here, can you just recall that story for me? Rather than it being after a certain amount of time and certainly controlled. And a lot of people criticise this research, saying that because Bartlett came up with the idea of reconstructive memory and how schemas can influence our memory, and then Bartlett was the one that tested it, a lot of people say that the research is then really subjective. So he's kind of been a bit biased and gone out of the way to use this research to prove his own theory to kind of prove himself right. All Port and Postman, though, do support what Bartlett is saying. They did a study in the 40s where they showed participants the picture that you can see on the screen. And actually, the picture is supposed to depict kind of a, a, a stereotype at the time. Obviously, this was the 40s. And um, if you actually look carefully at that picture, you can see that the black character is dressed much better than anybody else on the train and is much more respectable, particularly than the white character. But the problem is, after showing people this picture and then serial reproduction, so asking them to say, oh, what did you see in that picture again after a number of times? What happens is, is white participants kind of reverse their appearances and they started to say, oh, the white person was dressed better than the black person, even though that isn't true. But because that represents what they would expect, I repeat again, this was the 40s, but because that's what white people would have expected at this time, they changed their memory of the picture to fit in with their schemas and expectations, which does actually support Bart Bartlett's research, his study and obviously his theory of reconstructive memory. Loftus and Palmer, again, they did a, a study where they basically showed the influence of leading questions or how a verb can change our memory. So, for example, they showed participants a car crash and they asked participants to recall the speed in which the car was traveling. But they changed the verb that they asked participants every time. So some were asked how fast the car was traveling when it smashed into the other car. Some were asked how fast the car was traveling when it hit the other car. And what Elizabeth Loftus found is that when you change that verb, um, the speed that the car was travelling or the estimated speed from the participants changed as well. So participants said that the car was travelling faster when they were asked how far the car was travelling when it smashed the other car than when they said how fast was the car travelling when it hit the other car. So again, this idea of a verb or a word can change or influence our memory. Now, a strength of reconstructive memory isn't just what we've just said, but it's low. There is so much research out there that suggests that our memory is susceptible to change and isn't very reliable and can be changed by a number of different factors. We've already said that Bartlett's research isn't scientific. It doesn't follow standardised procedures. It's not got controls in place and therefore we can start saying that it's subjective. We can also criticise this for being particularly unrealistic. So how often are you read a story from a different culture and then asked to recall it? So we can say that it kind of lacks mundane realism in terms of what we're being expected to do. But it also lacks ecological validity because he claimed that it, the story itself was so strange in what he was asking participants to do that it wasn't like real life at all, which makes it really difficult for us to apply the findings. 
However, it is worth noting that Bartlett says it had to be like that. If I gave them a story where it was of what they've expected, then he wouldn't have been able to see the change in the story. So he's saying it had to be really strange to them. It had to be a really strange story in order to be able to see how they dealt with that brand new information. Again, we've talked about Allport and Postman, but actually this is hilarious. This study itself is an example of Chinese whispers, because if you Google this and you say, oh, what picture did they use? If you look on the screen now, they'll say it was that picture, which is a totally different picture than the one I showed you five minutes ago. So it's really interesting here where different websites claim that Allport and Postman used a different picture than they did. So we don't even know how reliable the results of that study are. Just an example, this is obviously an AS question. I appreciate you're doing GCSE, but you can pause and have a go at this. It's the same kind of style AO2 question, applying why information might have changed. And the mark scheme, if you want to just pause and have a look. I'm going through these quite quickly, but again, please feel free to pause the video at any point and have a go at these questions. And then the mark scheme for this, for Bartlett's study. Again, a couple more examples here for AO2 questions that you can have a go at. Model answer here for you to read. Another example, this is old spec again, but it doesn't matter. It's still a good opportunity for you. The mark scheme. And this is the one that we did in lessons, but I'm hoping this is particularly um, fresh for you. And just an, an opportunity here for a bit of further study if you want to go and research John Charles de Mendez. He's a real life um, recent case of somebody who unfortunately was shot and killed um, after the London bombings within the tube um, because he was misidentified and misclaimed to have done the shooting in the first place because actually the eyewitness testimony that came in wasn't reliable. And we can apply schemas to eyewitness testimony as an explanation for the fact that even when we're really confident in what we saw when we saw a crime, actually our schemas can change and confabulate our memories. So actually our recall of that event isn't accurate.